Right, thanks Jan. Um, glad to be here. Um, I'm going to start with how I'm going to run this is um, I will give two presentations. So I'll give um, the first presentation about does climate change cause war? And then we'll have a bit of a discussion. Um, I'll ask a few questions. You can ask me some questions. Um, and then we'll talk about the um, flip side of that, which is does war cause climate change? So that's where we're, um, how we're gonna, gonna run things today. So, okay, so the first question, does climate change cause war? Um, so I'm, I'll start with a, a quick recap of the research. Um, there's been about 20 years of research on this area on the links between climate change and conflict. Um, and um, summaries of the research have been produced by, by two particular organizations, Climate Security Expert Network, which is a research body, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who are the main advisors to the United Nations on issues related to climate change. And they produce reports every few years, and they've just produced another one, which um, I will talk about shortly. Um, and the regions most commonly examined when these issues are, are talked about um, are some of the most vulnerable regions. So Africa, parts of Asia, especially the Middle East, Pacific Islands, uh, the Arctic, and Latin America. So the, the, the main question, does climate change cause war? Well, there isn't really a simple answer, I'm afraid. Um, and, and this is what I'll explain as we go. What climate change does is it can reduce access to key natural resources. So for example, it can reduce um, access to drinkable water due to reduced rainfall um, or, or too much heat and, and less water is, is available. It can reduce access to food because food near crops need um, water to grow. So reduced uh, water leads to reduced crop growth. Also things like storm damage can reduce um, crop growth or, or uh, storage of crops, safe storage of crops. Um, then there's also the issue of land. Um, so climate change can also reduce the amount of land available for people. Um, and that can be due to sea level rise. So as, as the seas rise, um, less land is available or, um, or flooding cause damage, and, and less lands available, storm damage, and all these things also impact on availability of water and food, and also heat. So um, these things can contribute to conflict either directly or indirectly following um, migration, the movement of peoples around um, due to the impacts of not being enough water in some or in a certain area, or food shortages or, or land becoming less available, less safe to live in. Um, and, and that can lead to migration. And, and those people are, are called climate refugees. And, but whether that happens, whether climate change contributes to those problems depends on a lot of social and political factors. Um, so that's what I want to talk a bit more about now. So there are questions about, is the government badly run or well run? Uh, and that's important for fairness between different groups in society. It's important for help during crises when a storm hits or a flood hits or a drought hits. Um, if the government is well run, then it can help the society through that. Um, is there high inequality or poverty in a society? So are, are rich people taking um, a, a far larger section of, of the natural resources, meaning that poor people don't have enough food, for example, or if there's enough poverty, or if there's a lot of poverty generally um, in a country that means access to water or food or land or shelter is, is inadequate. Um, are there existing disputes between different social groups in the society? So that can be different ethnic groups, different races, different religious groups, different political groups. So that, that can affect uh, whether conflict uh, breaks out. 
And also, is there a recent history of conflict, and particularly of armed conflict? So uh, have there been wars recently in the country? So it, it, the, it, the answer to any of these questions is yes. And then climate change can make things worse, can cause a dispute to become a conflict, to become a war. So what does the latest research say? So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, the UN government advisors, they published a, a new report, a big new report, um, just a few weeks ago um, called Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability. And they, these are a few quotes from the summary of that report. Now, there's a lot of academic language here, but basically what these report, or what this report found was that, well, climate change can contribute or can make things worse um, it can increase the length of the conflict or the severity of a conflict or, or the frequency of conflicts. Um, but in general, it's the non-climate factors, the political and social factors that cause the outbreak of, of conflict and, and war. Um, and actually for the, the next, um, certainly for the next um, few decades, that's going to remain the dominant factor. If climate change gets even worse, worse than climate change could become a, a larger factor further down the line. So what are the potential solutions here? Um, so the, these are all around um, things like improved governments, governance, for example, better government, better, better training of government officials so they do their job properly, so they, they manage the economy, they manage the society, they manage the legal system better. Um, measures to reduce corruption um, here are important. There are elections, so everyone gets a, a say in what the government does and what the, how the government acts. Um, better international diplomacy, so, so when disputes arise between countries that they can be um, negotiated peacefully. And then measures to reduce poverty, so proper funding for water and sanitation services, better education, especially for girls, because in many parts of the world, education for girls is, is far inferior to that for boys. So that's an important element, support for farmers so that they can um, deal with crop shortages and, uh, and, um, and environment, climate pressures on, on um, growing conditions. Um, public services, and then re reduce inequality, the, the fair taxation system, so that the wealthy pay their fair share. Um, and again, some of the, these um, issue, uh, some of these factors like reducing corruption and, and well-funded public, public health services uh, uh, crop up again and again. Conflict resolution, you've got better education, particularly between cultures and religions, and also a, a well-functioning justice system. Um, and then, then at the bottom, we actually get into things designed to, to um, help tackle climate change specifically. So flood protection and adapting to the changing climate, so better protection against floods and storms, um, cooling of buildings um, so that they don't overheat, um, better emergency services, making sure the emergency services work well, and forestry protection, which can help against floods and, and um, useful for helping to prevent climate change um, because they absorb um, carbon emissions. So those are a number of solutions. Um, interestingly, these solutions are all consistent with the goals that were set in 2015 by the United Nations for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and these were 17 goals to tackle the problems already existing in the world. Um, so things like poverty and hunger, and, and poor health and environmental damage. And you can see a lot of overlap between these goals, these 17 goals, and the sort of solutions that I've talked about already. So if, if we tackle um, some of the injustices in the world already, um, we'll be helping to strengthen society so that it's less likely to fall into conflict as climate change hits and, and gets worse. And I want to... Um, give a case study um, to kind of bring alive some of these ideas. And, and I want to talk about Syria. And I put up a map here to make sure everyone knows where Syria is. Um, in the Middle East, um, borders on um, with Iraq, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, 
So the east end of the Mediterranean, so you've got Greece up in the, the, the top left and, and the rest of Europe over there. Um, so what happened with Syria was there was a severe drought over a three year period between 2007 to, uh, to 2010. It was the worst drought on record. And climate scientists had analyzed this, this drought and they estimated that the severity of the drought was somewhere between two and three times more likely because of human caused climate change. So whilst it's, it's very hard to say this drought was caused by climate change, droughts of this severity were made much more likely because of climate change. So, so there's a clear climate change component here. Um, but at the same time as this, this um, drought was happening, the government was pursuing a lot of um, unsustainable agricultural policies. So they were encouraging farmers to grow more crops um, that required more water than was available in that, uh, in that geographical area. Um, farming subsidies were being cut. So farmers were under pressure already because of government policies. And things were already going wrong as the drought was hitting. And so all these factors together led to massive crop failure, deaths of farm animals, and food shortages, which meant that price rises uh, for food were seen across the country. Um, and then what happened? So after, uh, uh, as um, things got worse for people in the countryside, for farmers, we saw a mass migration. About one and a half million people migrated from the countryside in Syria to the towns. Um, and at the same time as that was happening, the war in neighboring Iraq, the war in neighboring Iraq, which some of you will um, know something about, Britain was involved in that one, that led to about one, nearly one and a half million refugees from that war moved into Iraq. So in cities across Syria, the population became about 50% higher. And that put an enormous pressure on, on those cities and the services in, the, in those cities to, to be able to cope with that. The government, which was not democratic, didn't respond very well. There were illegal settlements, there was overcrowding, high unemployment, high crime, and all that led to um, what was called in, in 2011, the Syrian uprising, um, and massive protests across the country against the government because things were going wrong. Um, and that was part of a wider protest across the region called the Arab Spring. And the government in response, it was an undemocratic government um, and quite a violent government, um, to put it mildly, um, and they suppressed the protests. And, um, and that led in 2012 to a civil war. And that civil war continues to this day. And many other countries have been involved that, that that's a whole subject that we don't have time to go into. But, um, and see how that that um, things got worse very quickly with all those factors involved. So I'm I'm going to stop there and I'm going to ask a number of questions which we can we can talk about. I mean, firstly, if you've got any questions, please please do put them in the chat. But I want to pose a, a few questions for you to think about for us to discuss. Um, so and I'll leave these up. To so do you think climate change caused the Syrian war? What actions might have prevented the Syrian war? What actions should government prioritize as they to prevent other wars as climate change gets worse? In response to climate change, should government spend more on their militaries or more on civilian action? And, and what should we all should we all do more to stop or minimize climate change itself? So there, there's a few um, questions to to think about um, and I will I'm wondering whether should should I copy those questions and put them in the chat Jan yeah if you can do that yeah no that's been Where really really interesting so far Stuart um I think some of those answered questions you have answered actually during your presentation um yeah. so particularly the first one did did climate change um, cause the war um I think given your, your definition of um, climate change being a, a threat multiplier and the, the situation that was going on in Syria at the time, I think um, climate change may not have caused it, but it certainly didn't help 
Um, yeah. I've actually got a, a question for you. Um, yeah. you. You talked about the, um, the crop changes um, in Syria. The, the government was, in, was encouraging crop changes, was that right? Yeah, yeah. So they, well, they were, they, they, they were reducing subsidies. So the farming sector, farmers had a lot of subsidies um, in the mid 2000s. Um, and the government was phasing those out. Um, and part of the reason for that was the sort of global policy shift, arguing that there should be fewer subsidies in the agricultural sector and, and that farmers should you know, stand on their own two feet economically and shouldn't rely on government handouts. That's kind of the, the theory behind that, the policy theory behind it. But, but it was, um, regardless of the right or wrongs of that, in principle, and there's a question about whether it's right in principle, but certainly against that background of um, the drought getting worse, um, it, it was a terrible policy and really caused a lot of problems. And particularly when they're encouraging, you know, it, it's a region that is prone to drought and has become more and more prone to drought over the last few years. So to encourage a lot of crops particularly crops that were relying on water, if they weren't growing drought resistant crops, um, that was a problem as well. So that, that put them in a situation where they were vulnerable. And then climate change and, and the drought uh, just made that situation much worse. Yeah. Well, if anyone's got any responses to Stuart's questions, if you'd like to put them in the chat, and if you've got any questions of your own, we can either pick those up now or later on. Um, Actions that the government um, should prioritise to prevent other wars as climate change gets worse. Um, I think you, you talked of, you know, of a number of causes, a number of things that were done wrong. Um, if you've got an undemocratic government, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. And, and that's, well, the importance of, of how other governments around the world act um, is key in this, this respect. And trying to encourage them to pay more attention to um, what's happening um, in, their, in their country, what people are protesting about, um, um, both working with the United Nations agencies, so there are aid agencies, there are agricultural agencies um, that could help them there as advice um, and, and finance by the World Bank that they could have made use of. So there, there are ways in which things could have improved. Um, I think mean, it's very difficult without a detailed knowledge of Syria to, to go in, into the detail, and I don't claim to be an expert on Syria. Um, but there are certainly factors that, that could have helped and, and if international governments that are also, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the difficulties was that when, when the protests, um, when, when the government response turned violent, um, there was a tendency of um, governments around the world, not just to condemn the violence, but also to say, well, you know, this government is illegitimate, therefore it has to be removed. And, and that made things worse in many respects. It, it's being able to criticise, but then say, well, we need negotiation. We need to um, not inflame the situation. And I think that's part of the problem that international governments need to not inflame the situation because it can get worse very rapidly. And then it, as it, it just sends into civil war, then that, that's, uh, as we've seen, it, it just is so hard to um, stop, deal with, and, and different groups. I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling the number of groups, number of groups and number of countries that have got involved in that civil war. And that's one of the reasons why it's proven so hard to end. It's, it's not very really clear cut, is it? About, you know, it's one party against another. There's so many factors yeah. involved, yeah. yeah. There is, I mean, you, you can point to human rights abuses and, and, and the Syrian government um, early in the um, conflict committed quite a series of human rights abuses. But to then argue, well, the easiest thing to do then is to arm different sides to fight back against the government, that, that starts to get difficult. And then, then 
reports come out of those um, those um, anti-government forces committing human rights abuses, and then it, where where do you go from there? It escalates from there. Yeah. Good, thank you. Can I just ask you a question? One of the questions that you, you posted was, in response to climate change, should governments spend more on the militaries or more on civilian action? Can you say a bit more what you mean by civilian action? Well, I think civilian action is all the things we've been talking about. I haven't, I, I will in the next um, set of slides talk more about the military and its relationship to climate change. But there is, um, there is a view, and, and this is pushed by many governments across the world, that they should spend more on their military in response to climate change because, because of the possibility of climate-related conflict. Um, and, and this is not a view I share. Uh, I think there is a real problem at the moment that we are not funding the things that prevent war adequately enough, and, and rich countries are not um, that there is a commitment among rich countries to spend a hundred billion dollars a year helping um, poor countries both adapt to climate change that's happening and to reduce their own carbon emissions so that they follow a, a, um, a low carbon path. And, and we're nowhere near that level. It, it, that target might be met, that target was for 2020, that target might be met in the next year or two. And the fact that we can't even together enough money to tackle that well at the same time we're subsidizing fossil fuel use through various ways that kind of shows you that we're failing in the most basic civilian action and at the same time these same governments are saying well oh, but we need to spend more on our militaries or at least not reduce them well i mean now with the current situation um it's in Ukraine. Yeah, calling over themselves to say that we need to spend more in the military. Other excuse, yeah. And your last question, should we all do more to stop or minimise climate change itself? Well, that's a resounding yes. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everyone yeah. needs to do more. That's yeah. kind of an obvious one. I, I, yeah, I thought that might um, help. help. Okay. It okay. might be of interest to some people or, or some people have, have something to say about that. Okay. Anyway, Wait. please do. Say so. so do you want to move on to the second part of your presentation, Stuart? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, here we are. So does war cause climate change? So we're flipping the question around and looking at it from the other perspective. And the first thing I want to talk about here is what's called the military carbon footprint. Um, and you may have heard of carbon footprints, and carbon footprints being the ways in which an activity or a product causes climate change causes carbon emissions which lead to climate change, not just by the direct emissions um, that, that results from that activity. So for example, driving a car releases carbon emissions by burning the fuel in the engine. Um, but the carbon footprint includes the whole life cycle of that car. So it includes the building of the car, the extraction of the um, raw materials. So, we're taking an approach similar in the military sector, but the military sector is more complicated. So we, we call it a carbon blueprint. Um, so this diagram gives you an idea of the sort of things that are involved in, in estimating a carbon blueprint. So we'll start in the middle. So there's the use of the military equipment, the, the direct emissions. So you've got fighter planes, you've got tanks, you've got warships, all burning fossil fuels, emitting carbon into the atmosphere causing climate change. So you've got all, all of those, and, and these vehicles are, you know, they burn fuel like nobody's business. So uh, really, um, really high um, carbon emitters. Um, so you've got those, um, and that, that can happen. That's, those emissions don't just come during wartime, those emissions come during military exercises and patrols. So they happen during peacetime as well, and they, those are, are large during peacetime. Then you've got military bases. Um, and so you've got the energy you 
use at the military bases, um, heating or cooling, um, electricity used for all the equipment at those military bases, or radar stations, or, or just you know basic computer use or anything else. Then you've got the military technology industry um, and, and its own supply chain. So that supply, they, they, that's the area that builds the, the fighter planes, the warships, the tanks, all the ammunition, the missiles. Um, and then you've got the supply chain that feeds into that industry and they have a carbon footprint. And then you've got the raw materials that feed into that. Um, and, 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 and then there are other supplies, things like uniforms, food, the, the computers that are used. Um, then you've got the land that the military owns and, and whether that landscape is changing, whether trees are being cut down or whether trees are being grown, that, that influences as well. So that's all on the left side of the, the dotted line. And that's the sort of things that you would find in, in conventional carbon footprint. But the thing about the military is in it fights wars and wars emit carbon emissions and it's not just the use of the military equipment there are all the impacts of wars. so you've got um you've got things like if oil depots are bombed then that releases carbon emissions if forests are bombed then the trees burn and, and, and they release carbon emissions you've got health care of, of caring for the casualties and you've got post conflict reconstruction, so rebuilding after the war, and that can often be the highest, um, highest contribution of, of, of that area. And, and then I'll talk a bit about nuclear dimensions as well. So, so that's the carbon blueprint. Um, now, what we've done, um, we in SGR, we've done some research on this area, and we, we tried to estimate it. We didn't try to estimate the carbon blueprint of the UK military, because that, that was too difficult, but we tried to estimate the carbon footprint um, and we looked at the data that was available and uh, it's very patchy um, and, and the reason why it's patchy is because uh, militaries aren't required to report on all their carbon emissions so civilian sectors are but militaries aren't um, and so that's been a problem um, but Britain is one of the better ones. So there is, uh, is at least some data here. So we made, a, we made an estimate here and, and that's the graph on the right. And you can see there's an arrow pointing to the little blue block at the bottom, 0.9 million tons of carbon. Um, and that's the headline figure that if you look in the Ministry of Defence's annual report for this year, and, and this is a couple of years ago, we did this analysis, um, you'll see that the headline figure they publish is that 0.9 million tons of carbon. Um, if you look, in, if you dig into the appendix, and, and what that 0.9 million tons is, is that's just the carbon emissions of the military bases. Um, if you look in, in the detailed appendices, the technical appendices of the report, you'll, you'll find another 2.1 million tons. And these are the emissions of of all the equipment use, so the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and all, all of their operations. Um, so that, that's another 2.1 million tons. Then, then you look at the arms industry in the UK and, and the, the amount that it supplies to the UK military. And, and we estimated that was about another 1.5 million tons. And then the supply chain, and we estimated well, that could be 2 million tons. And then we, we looked at various other studies around carbon footprinting and, and how raw materials turn into uh, are used um, in this sector um, and, and in, in other comparable sectors. And so we estimated another 4.6 million tonnes. So in total, we estimated the carbon footprint was about 11 million tonnes. So that's about uh, more than 11 times the official headline figure. Uh, which shows there's a real reporting problem in this area. And we, we estimated that's equivalent to, to driving about 6 million cars. So it's not a small amount. And then we looked at the European Union. We looked at countries in the European Union. We looked at the whole European Union. We looked at um, the biggest military spenders in the European Union. And we found similar problems here. So this is a graph of the six largest military spenders in the European Union. Um, again, the, these are data from a couple of years ago. And the blue parts of the graphs are the headline figures. 
um, that were reported to the official um, UN um, climate body. And you can see France didn't report any that year. Um, and the orange parts of the graph are, um, are our estimates of the rest of the carbon emissions along the lines of what I've just shown you for the UK. Um, and you can see uh, they're much bigger in all the cases. Poland, the data was so bad, we couldn't even make an estimate. So you can see, again, massive problems with reporting that. Um, but that's the UK and the EU. What about the world's biggest military spender, the US? Um, by far the biggest military spender in the world, and, and that's our estimate of the US military carbon footprint. Um, so that's in the blue there, over 200 million tonnes. Um, nearly six times the combined carbon footprint of um, the EU and the UK. So that was our estimate there. Um, so what can we say about globally the contribution of the military carbon footprint? Well, it's very hard to give um, an exact number. I've tried at various times in the past. At the moment, I'm saying it's several percent of, of all carbon emissions, equivalent to a large European nation. It's that sort of scale. So um, we're doing some more research in this area at the moment, and we hope to come up with some more figures, um, more estimates, even though they'll, they'll still have a range of uncertainty on them. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the conventional weapons. I want to talk a little bit about um, nuclear weapons and climate change and the possibility of nuclear war, and that's in the news at the moment. With the, stare, with the situation in Ukraine and the, um, some other threats made by um, President Putin. So while it's well known that carbon emissions cause climate change, um, and there's a whole lot of concern about that, few people are aware that nuclear war, nuclear weapons could cause climate change. And yet there is some good academic research on that. Um, there was a lot carried out in the 80s, and that has been updated over the past 15 years or so. Um, and it shows that the impacts would be high even from a regional nuclear war. So it doesn't have to be a nuclear war between the countries with the biggest arsenals, which are the USA and Russia. Even countries with smaller nuclear arsenals like India and Pakistan cause massive impacts. And there are some key differences about between climate change caused by carbon emissions and climate change caused by nuclear war. The, the most obvious is the direction. Nuclear war would cause global cooling, um, a massive global cooling, and it would be much faster. So instead of happening over decades, it would happen over months and years, much, much faster. And the scale of it, a, a big nuclear war would, would cause um, a much larger climate change um, than we're, we're currently um, looking at due to carbon emissions, uh, at least over the next century or so. Um, so I'm, I'm going to um, show you a little diagram here just to illustrate how nuclear weapons um, can cause climate change and lead to what's called a nuclear winter. So. First thing is you have the nuclear explosions. Countries launch nuclear weapons at each other. Um, you have massive nuclear explosions. They cause fires. Those fires are intense. They spread, they merge, and lead to what's called firestorms. Um, those firestorms inject smoke into the upper atmosphere. So you get massive tall plumes of smoke um, that the most um, simple natural analogy is, is a volcanic eruption. Um, but these, these plumes would be much larger. Um, and that smoke would be injected into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, that would spread out, block out the sun, um, and that would lead to temperatures at the surface dropping sharply, plants and animals um, and humans, um, or plants dying immediately, and then humans and animals starving months and years following. Um, this is a graph of how that, how big those temperature changes would be. So this is a graph of the blue line is the increase in temperature that we have seen over the past hundred years or so due to carbon emissions. 
um, and, and the scale on the left is temperature change from the level at about 1970. So you can see that, that um, in the 1880s, it was below that temperature and in the last few decades, it's been higher than that temperature. So the temperature rise over that period has been about one degree. And, and this study was a couple of, uh, few years old. So this is um, only got the temperature increases up to uh, 2007. Um, but even here, you can see how the three scenarios, the three ticks, the red, the green, and the brown, um, which are different nuclear war scenarios, change the global temperature rapidly after that. So the red, red tick is, is a, a, at the smaller end of the scale. So this is a regional nuclear war. So if, if India and Pakistan fought each other, or if the UK decided to launch its nuclear missiles because it thought it was being invaded, for example. That's the sort of scale. So you can see in a couple of years, the temperature would drop by about 1.5 degrees, much bigger than we've seen over the past century, much, much faster, and then bounce back. And that sort of change is an enormous shock for ecosystems to deal with, enormous shock for human society to deal with. Um, the, the death toll would be massive. Um, but that's, that's the smallest scenario. Then you've got a bigger scenario, the green one. That's a, a global nuclear war, what we call a global low nuclear war. So that's all the current US nuclear weapons, US and Russian nuclear weapons. And that would cause a temperature drop of about three and a half degrees over the next couple of years, and then a rebound. Um, and that, that, that's equivalent to going into an ice age. So it, it's absolutely drastic. Not much of human civilization would survive that. And then you've got a bigger scenario, a global high scenario. And this was, when this research was done, the nuclear arsenals were bigger. Um, and that, that could lead to a drop of over seven degrees and, and that would finish off everything really. Um, and, and to kind of emphasize this point, here's a map of, of the um, estimates of the temperature change across the world, the geographical spread of that temperature change in the summer following a nuclear, um, following a nuclear war. And this is the global high scenario, so at the high end. And you can see you've got temperature drops of 10, 20, 30, 35 degrees in, in some areas in the summer. And of course, crop growth ecosystem functioning just would, would be so damaged and there'd be no crops and for years. And that's in addition to all the other impacts of nuclear war, which I haven't got time to talk about. So yeah, that's pretty scary, which is why we should be doing all we can to avoid it in the form of nuclear war. So what about reducing carbon military carbon footprint? What action is being taken to do that? Well, in the last couple of years, militaries have started publishing reports and, and plans and strategies. Um, and particularly in the run up to the COP26 climate negotiations, US, UK, NATO published various um, documents on this. Um, but all of them were um, a bit vague on the specific details and, and none of them have, as yet have clear plans for how to reduce emissions. Um, the sort of things they talked about, I'm going to take the UK one as the example. Um, so the UK Ministry of Defence um, so included with the, in the aims of seeking to use the green transition to add to our capabilities, fighting and winning in more ever hostile and unforgiving physical environment. So the, the priority in this document was using lower carbon technologies to be able to fight war more effectively, uh, which to me kind of misses the point of tackling climate change. We should be trying to do more to prevent climate change, to tackle the roots of climate change. So we'll come back to that point. Um, some of the measures they, they proposed for reducing carbon emissions um, a whole bunch of technical measures, and, and there were a number of problems with this. I, I, maybe we can talk about more of the details in the chat, but um, to give you one example, they're, they're um, looking to use biofuels um, in, as a replacement for fossil fuels in, in their jets. Um, 
so and, and one of the problems here is if you if biofuels come from crops crops need land to grow if climate change is reducing the area for crops to grow then and you're trying to use some of that land to grow crops to give you biofuels for your military then you're going to have less land for food so that's a real problem and then another issue is around nuclear power putting using nuclear power more what well, we we found in, in the ukraine war at the moment how dangerous it is to have nuclear power stations in war zones um, and and the risks that that creates so yeah so there there are all sorts of problems with these as i say we can we can um, take up these issues more in, in the discussion um but the the, the kind of um, approach here uh, i thought was summarized most neatly by the the us um in, the, in this document in the corner on the right um more fights less fuel so it's kind of you know being able to fight more using less fuel rather than actually let's fight less let's try and find better ways of, of preventing war um, and this goes back to what i was saying in the earlier uh, the earlier um, session so yeah and and then there's no threat from no mention of the threat to the climate from nuclear weapons that's completely um, ignored so i want to suggest an alternative way of thinking about it and part of this is tied up with how much money is being spent on the military and i've got some figures for the uk um comparisons from the uk which i present to you so the graph on the left um, looks at government spending over the current four-year period. Um, you've got the military core budget at the moment, which is approaching 200 billion over a four-year period, um, compared with overseas aid and reducing carbon emissions. Now, we need to reduce carbon emissions really urgently. So the fact that we are not spending more in that area, our plans are, are not adequate um, in any shape or form. So that's a real problem. That, that imbalance exists and then you've got overseas aid as well that's much less and and as we talked about um meeting the sustainable sustainable development goals is really important um and that's really important in preventing um conflict arising that that might be made worse by climate change so the fact that we're not spending more on that is a real problem and the graph on the right shows that um in the latest government spending plans, um, military, the military budget was increased by over 20 billion, while the overseas aid budget was cut by nearly 20 billion. So you kind of shifted from helping poor people, um, doing things that prevent war from breaking out or getting worse, and spending more on the military. Um, and I think that's a, that's a serious problem. And indeed, global military spending at the moment um, you can see at the bottom it's nearly two trillion pounds per year on uh, dollars per year and um, i put all the zeros there just to emphasize just what a what a large number that is so and and tying up with this uh, all sorts of questions around fairness um and one of the questions is is that um our military is being used to help preserve global inequality so there, there's a massive inequality in society um, you can see that the graph on the right, um, that's known as the champagne glass graph, um, and that's some analysis done by Oxfam a few years ago, looking at the emissions of the richest part of society, global society, and the poorest part of global society, and they found that the richest 10% of the world um, is responsible for nearly 50%, nearly half of the emissions. Whereas the poorest half of the world is responsible for only about 10% of carbon emissions. So there's a massive inequality there. And one of the things that militaries are being used to do, and this is the report on the left, um, Greenpeace looked at as an example, is that militaries are being used to secure um, deliveries of, of oil from the Middle East, for example, to wealthier nations so that they can continue to consume what is unsustainable and, and very high levels of energy use and carbon. And, and so the question is, are the militaries just being used to, to keep this unfairness in place? And 
Move, moving to the what was agreed at the climate negotiations at COP26 in Glasgow at the end of last year, um, you can see in this graph, this is a graph um, and the black line is the historical emissions and then you've got various scenarios of how emissions might fall over the future. And um, the one to draw your attention to is the one in the middle, pledges and targets 2.1 degrees C. That's where we're currently currently heading if everybody does what they all countries do what they say what they say they're going to do um, and where we really need to be to pretend to prevent the worst um, effects of climate change we need to be at the 1.5 degree line and that's the green line at the bottom the green area at the bottom and we are a long way from that and that's why there's a, a big red arrow saying there's an ambition gap there um, so that's part of the problem is that we're just nowhere near where we need to be to prevent a lot of the, the serious impacts of climate change. And, and one of those is that there's gross inequality in, in emissions and the militaries are consuming lots of fossil fuels as well. So how does, I want to just add something very current um, with how does the Russian Ukraine war affect this? Well, you've got a large rise in military carbon emissions of Russia and Ukraine. Um, and then uh, if they manage to negotiate a settlement, negotiations are ongoing. We'll see whether they can negotiate some peace after this. Um, there'll be large emissions following due to reconstruction of all, all the buildings that have been bombed. Um, but what's also happening is that Countries are, um, in many parts of the world are saying, well, you know, the world's less safe now, we're going to increase our military spending, and we're seeing that in Western European countries, and we've got to increase our military spending, the, the Russia's too dangerous, we need to spend much more on military, that will lead to more military carbon emissions, um, and efforts to reduce emissions are going to be, um, are going to be given a lower priority for that reason, and that's a big problem when we've got those targets to hit and and the biggest thing is of course that attention is being distracted from from reaching these carbon targets and we have we have to take major action this year um, to keep this target of 1.5 degrees alive and that's that's a real problem when attention is diverted elsewhere there are a few glimmers of hope i don't want to leave you in complete despair at the end of this and there are a few glimmers for hope. Um, one of the things is, is that um, with government saying, well, we, we, we don't want to buy Russian oil and ga gas anymore, is that that could lead to a, a faster transition away from fossil fuels. And there are some signs that countries are looking more at, at the alternatives. That's, um, that's a good sign. Um, and, and that would improve energy security, make countries more secure, as well as help them to tackle climate change. So that there's there's a possibility there um, that the alternative is, of course, they just buy oil and gas from somebody else. Uh, yeah. Um, another thing is that energy conservation, um, so saving energy, is genuinely cheaper than building new power stations. So the technology for things like home insulation, heat pumps is well developed now we, if we focused on on rolling out those technologies much more widely they would not only help save energy save carbon emissions they would also help tackle rising energy bills the cost of living crisis that's happening at the moment and fuel poverty so there there are lots of synergies between different different policy um, the same policy for tackling different problems and also the cost of renewable energy and energy storage technologies like batteries and green hydrogen um, are falling fast. Solar and wind are a lot cheaper now and, and um, can outcompete a lot of fossil fuels already. So there's there are some good possibilities there if we put more effort in that area. And, and the other side of it is the behavior change. If we can get the rich to reduce their carbon emissions more and, and um, we live in a rich country, we're all part of that system um then we can um we, we can transition very fast the things like avoiding flying or, or um using cars less or eating less meat all these things can make a difference and if they're, they're done on a much wider scale we can change very fast so and, and the other sign of hope is that 
there are a lot of people protesting out there, keeping this issue on the political agenda, um, and especially young people, and that's really important. So I, I will finish again with a few questions for discussion. Um, and, and of course, you can ask all your questions as well. Um, how can militaries be persuaded to accurately report their carbon emissions? How can military carbon emissions be reduced quickly? Should we focus on technology or political processes of some combination? Um, how do we stop nuclear weapons being used? That's a, that's a big question we've been talking about for decades, but I thought I'd throw it in there because it's important. And what are the priorities necessary for meeting the 1.5 global temperature target? So, yeah, I, <laughs> a lot of things to think about. Take your pick. Thank you, Stuart. There's some really interesting questions there to, to focus on. Um, I think what you've done in, in this presentation here is, is weave together a lot of the, the issues that we're currently facing in relation to tackling climate change, but also um, a lot of the government spending and um, how they see their priorities. So thank you for that. Um, does anyone have any comments they want to put to, to Stuart or any answers to his questions? What can we do? I would like to ask a question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I'm in Germany at the moment, and here it's a lot of the discussion, like cutting the fossil fuels from uh, Russia and instead importing like coal from the Middle East and gas from the Middle East. And like also uh, increasing like the time the um, coal mines, like the, uh, how do you call it? I don't know, like, uh, the, like the big mines in the Ruhrgebiet and so on, that they um, get more coal out, out of the ground. And what do you think about it? Well, what can you, what are the arguments against it? Like, it's like- I think, I think the critical factor is is around the sort of things I've said. So it, it is important to um, support both renewable energy. I mean, Germany does have a history of supporting wind and, and solar, um, which is very good. But, um, but where where they could do more is about energy consumption, uh, energy conservation, energy saving, and particularly in areas like um, car use and plane use. Um, those areas need more attention and and it is there is an issue and it's a, a difficult question but we need to tackle it is that the rich are using far more than um, a reasonable amount and and we do need things like um, um, measures to tax high carbon use um, we need much higher taxes on flying we need much higher taxes on large cars um, these sorts of issues so um and and um and yes and also um transforming the energy sector so that move more towards things like heat pumps which are which are very efficient ways to use electricity for heating rather than using gas thank you Stuart Hila you have your, your hand up did you want to ask another question I didn't recognize that I had, but I have another question. <laughs> um, like, yeah, there's a lot like talking about like the households, like that they, they need to cut the power or the heat, but like the biggest points of where like energy is used is like the industry or like not the households. And like, what do you think are like the steps we could do there? <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Yes, I should have mentioned industry in, uh, as well. Um, energy efficiency in industry is, is often a, a bigger factor. And again, the use of things like better insulation and heat pumps in, in buildings used by energy is important. I mean, there are, there are certain processes that can be improved. Things like steel manufacture could be made much lower carbon, um, moving away from using blast furnaces fueled by coal to using um, what's called hydrogen direct redu reduced iron so that um, you use hydrogen um, to produce the iron um, as a as, um, 
as a material to feed into the process um, to help uh, produce, um, help it, um, refine iron from iron ore and turn it into steel. And there, there's a lot of research and development going into that area, and you can see steel producers are starting to um, um, deploy this technology, and, and um, there are plans to roll it out on a much larger scale, and we, we need to scale that up, we need to make that faster. Um, and, and then also building, um, building energy standards as well um, need to be improved so that we are insulating any new buildings that get built, but also um, insulating um, the buildings that are already standing and making giving more incentives for that. And also things like training. Um, I, I'm not sure what the situation is in Germany regarding um, training, but I, I know in Britain that there's such an inadequate um, situation re regarding training people to do um, refurbishment of homes and, and, and businesses, the buildings. Um, and, and we need much more of that and we need much better support for that sector. Yeah, I think there, there's so much to be done in all of these areas in terms of tackling climate change at an individual, organisational, governmental, national, global level, as, as well as the interaction of that between the military issues that you've talked about. So um, in terms of you know, campaigning, awareness raising, um, just encouraging dialogue rather than um, military action. So um, I think that's that's what Michael's put in the chat as well about um, uh, the inability of authorities to speak to each other and understand each other. Um, so it's, it is more about trying to encourage people to discuss things rather than to take unnecessary action. So um, Stuart, I want to thank you for a very thought provoking um, and emotional um, set of presentations there. That was really interesting. I think the research you've done there, bringing those things together has been very, very powerful. So I want to say thank you, um, a big thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm gonna stop recording now.